Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Um, welcome to this episode of uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today I'm continuing uh, the study of the book of John, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, beginning with chapter 15, verse 1. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, uh, I really urge you to go back and watch it from the very beginning. This, I believe, is the most important book in the entire Bible. Now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV, and then oftentimes I like to look at it in the Amplified Translation. Sometimes I find that to be helpful. So let's begin uh, John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purchaseth. It may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Well, that's verses 1 through 3. Let's look at that in the Amplified and see how it states it. Uh, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly prunes uh, so that it will bear more fruit, even richer and finer fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have given you, teachings what I which I have discussed with you. Well, the idea of being uh, the uh, the vine, Jesus being the vine, and we're the branches. Um, I think it'd be helpful to understand this connection to the vine uh, by going back b before the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Go, let's go back all the way to the Garden of Eden and at the creation of man. Um, when, when the Bible says that, uh, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, uh, it, it's important to understand that God is speaking, but he's speaking in the plural. Let us make man in our image. And what is the image of God? Well. God is triune, one God, yet three distinct persons, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, each equally God, yet one God. So man was made in the image of God in that uh, I am one person, and yet uh, there are three aspects to me also. Uh, we have the, the body, we have the mind or soul, and we have the spirit. So we could say that uh, the, the the body is me, but it's it's uh, and the soul is me and the spirit is me, and yet there's only one me. But even though there's three aspects to me, uh, so when did man become a living soul? Well, that's when God breathed His Spirit into Adam as He formed him from the the, the clay. Well, this, uh, he, I believe this is uh, God breathing the Holy Spirit into Adam. And Adam and Eve, uh, they had the Holy Spirit of God in them. Their, uh, their spirit and God's spirit were united, kind of like the branch and the vine being connected. Um, I used to have a t-shirt I was looking for it earlier so I could wear it today, but it says get connected and it shows the the, the, the cross, the upright and the horizontal part being connected and, and the idea of being connected is very important for us to understand in this chapter and even as I said back in the beginning when we first understand the 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 Godhead and how man is like that. 
So the man has a body, soul, and spirit, and the spirit is connected to the spirit of God, and that's uh, the Holy Spirit. What happened when man fell is that when God, when man rebelled against God and declared his depend, independence from God, saying that I'll eat from the from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then I will be like God. See, man believed Satan's claim rather than God's claim. God claimed that if you don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, otherwise you will certainly die that day. And Satan said, well, God said that to you, but it's not true. The truth is you won't die, but you'll be like God, understanding right and wrong, good and evil. And if you do understand that, you'll be able to make your own decisions and be independent. Uh, and Adam and Eve believed uh, Satan rather than God. That's the first sin. The, the first sin was unbelief. They didn't believe God. And this is the sin that is, uh, man must, must repair through belief in Jesus Christ. Uh, but when man didn't believe, uh, this, this caused the, the, the Spirit of God to be withdrawn. And it's like the, the branch being broken off from the vine. Uh, it's like pulling an electrical cord out of the, out of the electric socket. Uh, you, it's the connection severed and then there's no energy. No, and it, it's like the, the, my internet connection being uh, broken. And, uh, so these are ways we uh, hopefully you'll understand what happened and what this verse is really talking about, being connected to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father. Uh, the last chapter, it, it talked about the Father being in us, the Son being in us, the Holy Spirit being in us. Uh, and it's this connection to God that, that uh, man originally had was broken and must be restored. Uh, so let's keep that in mind as we're reading this chapter. So let's go to verse 4 now. Abide in me, and I in you, and the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, uh, except it abide in the vine. No more, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Uh, you must abide in Jesus. You must put your faith in Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, enters you, that's the baptism of the Spirit, when the Spirit first enters us, the, the Holy Spirit then dwells in us continuously, that's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the Spirit of Holy Spirit is connected to man's spirit, man's spirit is brought to life, and uh, we're regenerated, we're born again spiritually. Uh, and then we also sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that means that this connection can never be broken again. But uh, if we don't have this connection, that's when you can't bear fruit. You can't. You're you're not even a, a, a living spirit. And you have a living soul, which is your mind and consciousness, your ability to think, make decisions, uh, choose, or reject Jesus Christ. You have that ability. You have a, a living body that can do all those bodily things, and, and yet the spirit was dead and must be uh, brought to life by faith in Jesus. Uh, so, um, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. So as long as, you know, we must, uh, we must first get the branch grafted back into the vine. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So when we have the power of God, we're connected to the power of God, uh, it's obvious that uh, we're able to bear fruit. For without ye, me, ye can do nothing. Well, a person that's never put their faith in Jesus, their spirit's dead, not brought to life, uh, they're still able to think. They're still able to understand right and wrong. 
They're still able to make a choice to do good or bad. And there's plenty of people who are not uh, biblical Christians, uh, that, but they do charitable things. They do good things. Uh, so we are able to uh, do good things, uh, even without the Holy Spirit of God living in us. Uh, but when we are connected to the Holy Spirit, we have the power of God working through us. So you, you certainly should be expecting that not only that you're going to do good, but you have the power to do good. Uh, verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. That's the state of every man before they're born again and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So everybody who has not been restored had not been connected to the vine. Uh, this is their, their fate. Uh, uh, Herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So we, we don't bear fruit. Uh, and we don't do good works in our life uh, as a uh, means of achieving salvation. Works are not required to get saved. Uh, we don't bear fruit and do good works uh, as, a, as a means of maintaining this connection. Uh, we're going to be connected to that, and that will be never severed again, regardless of whether we're producing fruit or doing works or not. And yet, uh, if uh, we have the ability to do great works, because the Holy Spirit of God can work through us, and 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 if someone is not bearing fruit, it's not it should not be used as evidence or proof that there is no connection to God, that they're not a, a Christian. Uh, but it glorifies God when we do good works. And uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, uh, and 10, these verses tell us the relationship between uh, faith and works. Uh, it says that we're saved by grace through faith, uh, not by works. So um, we're, works are not required to get saved. Faith is the requirement to get saved. And yet verse 10 tells us that that we should do good works. That's the purpose of our of creation, is God wants to work through us, and uh, he wants us to be productive and do good. But uh, how, how much good do you do? How many works do you do? Well, it varies from individual to individual, and, and uh, some people do a lot of great things. Some people do less. Some people do nothing. Uh, that we should not take a person's works in their life as an indication of whether they're saved. Uh, it's just a question of how uh, how fruitful they are. Uh, it's like the parable of the, the, the sower. Uh, a lot of people think in the four examples that only the fourth example is someone saved because they grow, bear fruits 30, 60, 100 times. Um, and, and yet, the, if you study it, you can see that um, three of the four are actually saved. Uh, the first example is uh, the birds snatch it away. It's never, it's never sprung, springs to life. So that person is not saved. But the, the, the one that fell on shallow ground and the one that fell on thorny ground, they're saved. Their seed sprung to life. It's just that they're not productive. They did not producing fruit. And uh, that's true with, with all of us. So I would caution everyone to not judge other people's salvation based upon how fruitful they are. Um, now, let's go to verse, uh, verse 9. As the Father lo hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. His, his commandments are not the 613 laws of Judaism. Uh, Jesus' commandments are to love God and love each other. Uh, so he says, keep your commandments, uh, uh, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So love, uh, love is uh, 
act it out. I mean, love is, some people say love is a noun, love is a verb. It's both. Uh, but when we think of love as a verb, it's acting, it's being loving. Uh, verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that you might, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now, the joy is the thing that I see so greatly lacking among many professing Christians. Uh, and that's just, it, it, it's tragic that someone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ, and they're, they're regenerate, their spirit's brought to life, and yet they, they, um, they get led astray by false teachers uh, who uh, put them in, in chains, in uh, bondage, uh, legalism, you know, thinking that they've got to do works to uh, keep that salvation or to prove that you're one of the truly saved. And then that's a state where it can, if you can never have confidence and assurance of your salvation, and therefore it's oftentimes people, they don't have any joy because they don't have any assurance. Verse uh, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. His command is to believe in him. Uh, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth, go and bring forth fruit. Now he's talking to the apostles right now. He's not talking to us uh, as a whole. Uh, he's not talking to the whole church. He's talking about he's, the, these apostles. Were, you were selected. I selected you to be my apostles. And uh, there's a purpose. And you're ordained. You should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it. Uh, I had a revelation on the same verse uh, in a previous chapter uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that a lot of people take this, and I've taken it this way in the past. I'm glad that now I, I believe I understand it correctly. It says, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And many people take that to believe that uh, when you put your faith in Jesus, you can ask God for anything in the name of Jesus, and you're guaranteed you're going to get it. You want money, you want health, you want uh, anything, and he's going to say yes. And, uh, and when they don't get their prayer answered in that way, they're depressed and thinking that, well, Maybe I'm not really Christian. Maybe maybe there's sin in my life. Maybe my faith is lacking. I need more faith. Uh, and again, this is another thing that causes loss of joy and assurance and and and, and uh, happiness. Uh, but this verse is directed to the apostles, uh, telling them that I'm going to send you off on a missionary journey, and during this time, signs and wonders were were. Uh, common because the Jews demanded a sign. So not only Jesus did miracles, but he sent his uh, his apostles and disciples out, and they did miraculous things. And he's, he's saying, I'm sending you on a mission to tell people about me, and during this time, I'm going to give you the power to ask things in, in uh, the Father for things in my name, and we'll give it to you because this is the time in history where we need to show signs to, to jumpstart the church so that people will, uh, will understand that these are not just uh, um, false claims or uh, these, the, these claims that Jesus is God, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus does have the power of life everlasting, and he, uh, he, Jesus is offering it to everyone as a free gift. These are the claims, and for people to believe those claims, they just didn't, were well, just going to accept it blindly, so they did miraculous signs. That's what this verse is talking about when it says, he says, um, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. 
That's not applied. That's not intended to apply to us today and to the entire church. That was a particular group, small group of people at a, a certain window of time in history where signs were necessary to prove that, hey, this is truly the Messiah that we're, uh, we're telling you about. Verse 17. Um, these things I command you, that ye love one another. Uh, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. So he's telling us to love each other. And not only says, if the world hate you, but he also tells us the world will certainly hate you. The, the world hates all of us who proclaim that Jesus is the only way to salvation. People say, how dare you? What about the Buddhists and the Mormons and the, even the good atheists in the world? Uh, just because they didn't believe in Jesus, or they're, they're, they're going to go to hell. Uh, you've got a lot of nerve making such a claim. It's outrageous and they're offended by it. Uh, so this is what we can expect to be hated. But we must we must be firm, and we should not compromise. I, I, I'm, it's, it sickens me when I see even some famous people like Billy Graham, Joel Osteen, and others being interviewed, and they're asked, well, what about the, the Buddhists and the people around the world that don't ever believe in Jesus? I mean, some of these are good people. Are you saying they're going to go to hell because they didn't believe in Jesus? And Billy Graham and Joel Osteen and, and, and many others they, they they will not stand up for Jesus and say, yes, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All they've got to really do is say, this is the claim of Jesus. I, I'm not the one that's telling you that that uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhism is not the way and Islam is not the way. Jesus says he's the one and only way. The question is, will you believe Jesus or not? That's what this really boils down to. Verse 20, remember the word that I said unto you, that the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you're a, a, a Christian, someone who's come out of the closet and not kept your Christianity secret and private and personal, but someone who cannot keep your mouth shut about Jesus, that is so excited about the the free gift of salvation that you receive and that and you know that Jesus wants you to tell everybody Jesus is offering you a free gift of eternal life too. And for those of us who are vocal and bold and, and uh, uh, want to talk about Jesus all the time, uh, if that's you, I guarantee you, you've been persecuted in some way. If nothing else, it's just people rolling their eyes and thinking that you're a fool. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's, there's things from just people thinking you're a fool, to calling you names, to getting uh, some form of violence against you, to beheading you and burning you alive in a cage like they're doing now in the Middle East, how ISIS is, is treating uh, Christians. So Jesus said, Look, if they persecute me, imagine how much they're going to persecute you. You're just a follower of me. You're definitely going to get persecuted too. Uh, verse 21, But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, uh, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not, they had, not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. Um, they can't, in other words, they can't, can't deny your sin uh, because now Jesus has made it clear that, wait, everybody's a sinner. Everybody needs the Savior. There's no exceptions. And once a person understands that, there's certainly no excuse for them. Verse 23, he that hateth me hateth my father also. That's a, that'll really ang ang angry the, the Jews. Every time Jesus identifies himself with the Father and gives himself equal status with the Father, that really angers the Jews. And this is really the reason that he was executed. He, he was uh, found guilty and condemned and, and killed is because of his claims that uh, 
I am the Son of God, making himself equal with God. Verse 24, if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, um, they had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without cause. I think that's a quote from Isaiah uh, 53, maybe. But let's look at that and then notes. That's verse um, 25. Oh, there's no footnote on that. Um, verse 26, but when the Comforter comes, that's the Holy Spirit, uh, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So again, he's telling them that this Holy Spirit will come. Uh, he says that he will be going away and the Holy Spirit will come. And verse 27, and ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. So he's talking to his apostles and many of them have been with him from the very beginning of his ministry, from the time that he was baptized by John the Baptist. All right, so that's chapter 15. I'll pick up the chapter 16 next time, but first let me sum up the, the gospel message for you. Uh, the gospel is Greek, and it means good news. The good news is that God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, uh, to die for our sins so that so that we can have eternal life in heaven. That's how much God loves you. And some people want to say, well, God hates you because you're a sinner. But the Bible says exactly the opposite. It says that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was a verse in this chapter that said, there's no greater love than giving your life for a friend. Jesus demonstrated the greatest love of all. He was willing to lay down his life for you and me. So uh, the, the problem though is that almost all the people in the world today, and almost all the people throughout all of history, they don't understand the good news. They either are ignorant or misunderstand it. And most people think that the means of salvation is through personal merit. That they think that if they join a religion, and become religious, follow a set of religious rules, and then when they die and go to get judged by God, God will say, oh, you did well. You've, you've been very good, so you get to enter heaven. And they think, they don't know exactly how good they've got to be, but they're hoping, they've got their fingers crossed, that they've been religious enough, they've been good enough, and God will approve of them. But the, the Bible says that's a lie from the devil. The, the Bible says that that's man's way of seeing it, but the way God sees it is uh, none of us could ever be good enough to satisfy God because the standard uh, that God has uh, was set by Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And, and the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ is the glory of God. And the, his life is the standard you've got to meet. Unless you think that you can die and go to God and say, I'm just as good as Jesus. I've never sinned. Well, if you can't make that claim, then you better start thinking, wait a second, I'm in trouble. Uh, I know I haven't been perfect. Even if you think that you're better than most people, being being better than most people, not good enough. The Bible says no one is righteous, not even one. So when you understand the predicament you're in, maybe perhaps you can understand now your need for the Savior, your need to be rescued. Uh, so the Bible tells us that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He came down from heaven. He became a man named Jesus Christ. He became a man in order to die. He needed to die to pay for our sins. And he was faithful. He willingly went to the cross, suffered and died. He paid for all of our sins. 
Now man is reconciled. All of mankind is reconciled. Our sins are paid for. Now we have access to God, but the, now the, the burden is on you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because even though your sins are paid for, you don't have eternal life. You have the sentence of death on you. The Bible says that uh, if, if you have not put your faith in Jesus, that someday you will suffer the second death. That means you go into the lake of fire and you perish. So uh, if, if you don't want it the second death, instead you want to receive the gift of life everlasting, Jesus is saying, here, here it is. I'm offering it to you. It's a free gift. That's how much I love you. I paid for your sins, and now here's eternal life. If you just receive it, you receive it through faith in him. So don't put your faith in your own ability to please God. Put your faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Depend on him completely. Rely upon what he's done for you. Rely upon who he is. Rely upon his faithfulness to keep his promise. He promises you life everlasting if you'll trust him. Trust Jesus now. And he gave us a sign to prove his claims were true. He was crucified, died, buried in the tomb for three days, and then he raised himself back to life bodily. And he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. And they saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. And the bodily resurrection is the proof Jesus gives us that his claims are true. He is Savior. He is God. He's the sole source of life everlasting. Put your faith in him now. Receive the gift of life everlasting. And the, the comforting thing is that once you've received it, the Bible says he will never leave you or forsake you. No one can pluck you out of his hand. Even if you have no faith, he will remain faithful. So once you've put your faith in Jesus, you're guaranteed you'll go to heaven because his promise is irrevocable. He cannot lie or break a promise. Thank you for watching. Uh, bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.